Temperatures are skyrocketing. Large swaths of the planet are becoming uninhabitable. The largest mass migration in our planet's history is on the verge of happening. But what if there was a way to stop it all and cool our planet? Would humanity try it and what would the consequences be? It's being called the world's fire escape plan. And in tonight's Prime Focus, Ginger Z shows us the promise and peril of the efforts to literally dim the sun. It's a climate solution that seems both three, two, one fantasy, yet almost too easy. Just reflect the sun and make it cooler on Earth. But could we do that? And more importantly, should we do that? We've done such a poor job of geoengineering our climate with our carbon emissions over the last several hundred years that we now need to geoengineer it in a positive direction to offset that. For more than 10 months, Earth's temperature has been the hottest on record. So now, ideas that were once considered outlandish are gaining momentum. We're talking about new scientific innovations on ways that we might manipulate our Earth to be cooler. On the east side of the San Francisco Bay, on deck the decommissioned USS Hornet, scientists from the University of Washington and a group called Silver Lining are giving us a glimpse at a first-of-its-kind outdoor study meant to develop a technology called marine cloud brightening. Woo! Chilly up here. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. This is Command Center. What's happening here? We're just discussing the weather condition of the day to pick up the data that we are trying to measure. Here, they're blowing tiny particles of salt water into the air. In position. Liquid check. So someday, we may be able to intentionally cool the earth. Air on. Opening the valve 20%. There is the plume. Opening There's the plume. We can see it. Yeah. All of this to recreate something that humans have unintentionally been doing for more than a century. If you look at satellite images, you can see where ships go over the ocean. The sulfur they're producing from their engines produce small particles in the atmosphere and often leave brightened cloud streaks. We call them ship tracks. What we would be doing is making a clean ship track um, out of sea salt. While this experiment is super small and not meaning to brighten clouds yet, this is how it would work. Pressurized air mixes with water and salt concentrate. Then that salt water blows out of the head of a device like this and goes into the atmosphere. The perfectly sized sodium molecule gives already existing stratocumulus clouds a boost, helping them attract more water. More water can make them brighter. When those clouds are brighter, they reflect more sunlight, which can cool the temperature at the surface. Can it go to scale? If these things are really far from scale. It would be hundreds of millions, potentially, that you'd have to do? It would be billions, billions, for sure. Yeah. Billions of dollars for something that will not help everyone. Marine cloud brightening's impact will be more local. The first question I get is, what does this mean for where I live, for my community, for my region, for my country? What will the impacts look like for food security, for water security, for extreme events? More often than not, I don't have an answer. And that's because we haven't really seen sufficient research into impacts. Silver Lining agrees. More voices are needed in this conversation on top of expanding the research. There is a risk that if we do not do this right, with the right partnership, the right collaboration in the global south, it could end up becoming knowledge that is solely held in the global north. Marine cloud brightening, though, not the only form of solar climate intervention. Something as simple as painting a parking lot or roof white. People are even talking about putting mirrors in space to actually reflect the sunlight. And then there's something called stratospheric aerosol injection. So for example, humans might decide to put little aerosols, which are just tiny particles that fall slowly up into the upper atmosphere, where they would stay for a year or two, and they would reflect a little tiny bit of sunlight, like less than a percent, back to space. Professor David Keith says he and others have done the research. Reflecting sunlight to cool the Earth from the stratosphere is possible. Think about the fact that one kilogram of sulfur in the stratosphere can reflect as much sunlight as a million kilograms of carbon dioxide trap as heat in the lower atmosphere. So there's this huge leverage. The big questions are all about who makes a decision, what the risks are, what the benefits are. It's that part, not knowing the full extent of the risks. That has a lot of people upset that it's already happening. I think it's completely unacceptable and absurd that this is actually happening. I think the challenge 
is when you try to do research well and you try to build governance frameworks, maybe it moves a little bit slower. Slow is not the word that Luke Eisman and Andrew Song want to hear. I'm ready to start packing whenever you are. Yeah. Why are all these researchers saying that more research is needed before we do the urgency of the climate crisis? In my opinion, calls for quite a bit more direct action of all sorts. Perfect. Yeah, buddy. These two are on a mission to do just that themselves out of the back of their RV. Does the RV have a name? Uh, I've called the hotspot Song Force One. Okay. <laughs> Today's a beautiful day to launch some balloons. We drive to Luke's plot of land in the South Bay. Andrew and Luke run a company called Make Sunsets. I designed and then 3D printed a nozzle for this that lets us just hook the balloon directly up. Selling what they call a cooling credit. People pay them to inject sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. The goal is get it up to 66,000 feet. Exactly. Three, two, one. The team says they can track that sulfur dioxide. The goal? Getting it to fly above 60,000 feet, all the way to the stratosphere. That's nearly double the height that commercial airplanes fly. Once in the stratosphere, the balloon pops, and the sulfur dioxide is released. All those sulfur dioxide particles mix and spread. Each molecule reflects the sunlight. Put enough up there, and you could essentially dim the sun. We're using sulfur dioxide. It's very well understood because volcanoes have emitted it for millennia. What are we looking at to make a dent? If you wanted to cool the Earth, say, half a degree centigrade, you'd want to put one or two million tons of sulfur into the stratosphere every year. Make Sunsets has, in total, put less than 75 pounds of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere over the last year. What do you say to a critic who would say, what they're doing is negligible and it's just a stunt. It is negligible. Everything's negligible when it starts. If it was a stunt, we would have done it once and stopped. And if it's negligible and it's a stunt, then they shouldn't care. But people do care. In 2023, the White House put out a report highlighting the importance of researching solar radiation modification. With pushback growing, some states, like Tennessee, are even considering laws to ban solar geoengineering. We're not going to allow injection of chemicals into the air in Tennessee. I want people to know that this conversation is happening. I want them to know that this idea exists. Suchi Talati is fighting to make sure that the people most impacted by climate change have a seat at this table. The idea that someone individually or unilaterally would make that decision for the rest of the world is unacceptable to me, especially when that's coming from the perch of privilege, because that's what colonialism is. We have constructed entire economies and agricultural food output systems based on how these systems work. And so when we think about solar geoengineering interacting with them and potentially disrupting them, people get really scared. But at this point of our climate crisis, isn't it risk versus risk? The CO2 from our past emissions is in the atmosphere, and it's causing real harm to humans today. Solar geoengineering could reduce some of that damage in the future, and solar geoengineering will bring its own risks. Three, two, one. Despite the controversy, Luke and Andrew say, we don't have time to waste. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of getting teared up because I'm thinking about my kids. Um, it's just, it's, it's something that, like, I hope more people learn, learn about this, and they, do the research, I think people's minds will start shifting. We are in a non-stop carbon party. Global levels of greenhouse gases have gone up every year of our lives. Until that changes, we can't even contemplate anything other than way more radical action than we're doing. Whether the idea is to reflect the sun with aerosols or brighten our clouds, the power of us will determine what happens next. Solar geoengineering, from my perspective, was never an idea to solve climate change or address the actual problem, but we also don't have a lot of ideas right now on what to do around impacts. And so when we look at the core of the problem, emissions, the fossil fuel industry, we absolutely need to get to net zero, and that is the priority. Our thanks to Ginger Z for that.